On August 25, 2012, a discovery was made that would lead to scientists shocking the entire country. No. Yeah. No. He's been here at least 500 years. Now he's packed in polythene bags in a cardboard box, and he's now going to be taken away. The event wasn't just about finding King Richard III's bones. It was about the DNA bombshell they found inside them. This genetic evidence has now been linked to Mary, Queen of Scots, revealing a massive discrepancy in the royal bloodline. This isn't just a historical footnote. It's a revelation that challenges the legitimacy of centuries of kings and queens, and it started under a layer of asphalt in Leicester. What the Leicester Dig really found. For over 500 years, Richard's body was missing. He was the last English king to perish in combat, vanquished at the Battle of Bosworth Field in 1485. His defeat ended the brutal, decades-long Wars of the Roses and handed the crown to his rival, Henry Tudor. Richard's body was reportedly taken to Leicester, given a quick burial, and then the church he was in was destroyed decades later. History, written by the Tudor victors, painted him as a monster. William Shakespeare famously called him a poisonous bunchbacked toad. But the man himself? He was gone, erased by time. Until that dig. The team found the church's foundation, and then, in a place that would have been the choir, they found human remains. It wasn't a grand tomb. The burial was a mess. The skeleton was crammed into a grave that was too short, with its head propped up awkwardly. There was no coffin, no shroud, no artifacts. It looked like a hasty, disrespectful burial. But then came the details. The skeleton was male in its early 30s, Richard's age when he passed. And the spine wasn't bunch-backed, but it had a severe twisting curve. This was adolescent onset scoliosis, a condition that would have made one shoulder visibly higher than the other, but could have been easily hidden by armor or royal robes. This was a direct hit against the cartoonish propaganda of Shakespeare. Then they looked at the injuries. The bones told a horrifying story of his final moments. The skeleton had 10 separate wounds, eight on the skull alone. These weren't from a distance. These were close quarters, personal and brutal. A sword had sliced off a piece of the back of the skull. Another blade had punctured straight through the top of his head. And one of the most gruesome injuries, likely the one that ended him, was a massive blow from a halberd, a giant ax-like weapon that cleaved into the base of his skull, entering inches deep. This matched historical accounts of Richard being surrounded, unhorsed, and fighting to his last breath. The evidence was overwhelming. This had to be the lost king, but in science, had to be isn't good enough. They needed absolute proof. They needed something that couldn't be argued with, something that survived 500 years in the dirt, his DNA, but proving it would require a journey into the very DNA of royalty itself. How science confirmed a king. Finding the king's DNA was one thing. Matching it was a completely different problem. You see, King Richard III has no known living direct descendants. His only legitimate son, Edward of Middleham, passed away as a child. His illegitimate children faded into history, their lines lost. So, how do you match the DNA of a man who has no family left? This is where the real genius of the investigation began. The scientists and genealogists had to think sideways. If you can't trace a line down from Richard, you trace it down from one of his siblings. They focused on Richard's older sister, Anne of York. The team needed to find a living person who was a direct, unbroken maternal line descendant of Anne. This is where the science gets incredibly cool. They were looking for something called mitochondrial DNA, or mtDNA. Think of it like this. You get almost all your DNA from both your parents. But there's one exception. You get your mitochondrial DNA only from your mother, and she got it only from her mother, who got it from her mother, and so on. It's passed down like a family heirloom, a perfect copy carried from mother to child, unchanged for thousands of years. It's a genetic flashlight that cuts straight through history. The genealogical search was like a needle in a global haystack. 
they had to trace a family line from the 1400s all the way to the present day, through only daughters. They followed the line from Anne of York, down 17 generations. It led them to a woman named Joy Ibsen, who had passed away in 2008, but Joy had children. The line led them to her son, Michael Ibsen, a Canadian-born furniture maker living in London. Michael Ibsen had no idea he was related to royalty. He was just a regular guy. Now, suddenly, he was being told he might hold the key to identifying a lost king. He agreed to give a DNA sample. Back in the lab, scientists had carefully extracted the ancient DNA from Richard's skeleton, specifically from a dense part of his thigh bone. They compared Michael Ibsen's mtDNA to the mtDNA from the 500-year-old bones. The result? A perfect match. The chances of this being a coincidence were astronomical, something like one in billions. It was a scientific slam dunk. The skeleton under the parking lot was, beyond any shadow of a doubt, King Richard III. The entire country celebrated. A lost king had been found and identified, and history was rewritten. But not all things are what they seem. The team had found their king, but they were about to find a secret that wasn't his. With the king's identity confirmed, the scientists got curious. The mitochondrial DNA had worked perfectly. So, what about the other side of the family? What about the Y chromosome? Just as mitochondrial DNA is passed only from mother to child, the Y chromosome is passed only from father to son. It's the genetic signature of a male bloodline. Richard III got his Y chromosome from his father, Richard, Duke of York, who got it from his father and so on, all the way back to their great-great-grandfather, King Edward III. This single ancestor, Edward III, was the patriarch of both warring houses in the Wars of the Roses. Richard III's family, the House of York, and his rival's family, the House of Lancaster, were all descended from this one man. So, the scientists had a brilliant idea. They would find living male line descendants of Richard's extended family, trace their Y chromosome back, and see if it matched Richard's. This would not only reconfirm the findings, but also paint a complete genetic picture of the Plantagenet dynasty. They found several living men who were direct, father-to-son descendants of Edward III's other son, John of Gaunt. John of Gaunt was Richard III's uncle, and his line includes the famous Beaufort family. These living descendants, including the Duke of Beaufort, agreed to give DNA samples. In the lab, the team compared the Y chromosome from these living men to the Y chromosome from King Richard's bones. They were expecting another perfect match. They got the opposite. There was no match. It wasn't just a slight difference. It was a completely different genetic signature. The Y chromosome of King Richard III did not match the Y chromosome of his own extended family. This was the bombshell. In scientific terms, this means a non-paternity event had occurred. In simple sixth grade language, it means that somewhere in the centuries of royal marriages, births, and successions, the official father was not the biological father. Someone's mother had a child with another man, and that child was raised as the legitimate heir. This wasn't just court gossip. This was a scientific fact, a definitive break in the pure royal bloodline. But this discovery was no longer about Richard III. It was about the very family that defeated him, the family that built the modern monarchy. But the real question wasn't if the line broke. It was where and who. Is the entire monarchy based on a lie? This is where scientists shocked the entire country and where the story pivots to Mary, Queen of Scots. The broken Y chromosome wasn't just a random piece of family trivia. It struck at the heart of the entire British monarchy. Here's why. The current royal family, the Windsors, don't trace their claim to the throne through Richard III. They trace it through the family that beat him, the Tudors. How did the Tudors get the throne? Their founder, Henry VII, the guy who vanquished Richard at Bosworth, had a famously flimsy claim. His entire claim was based on his mother, Margaret Beaufort, who was a descendant of John of Gaunt, the very same man whose Y chromosome line was just tested. The Tudors reigned, and then the throne passed to their cousins, the Stuarts. The first Stuart King of England was James I. And who was his mother? 
none other than Mary, Queen of Scots. Mary, Queen of Scots, is the genealogical gateway to the modern crown. Every single monarch for the last 400 years, every Stuart, every Hanoverian, and every Windsor, including the current king, traces their right to rule back through her. But Mary's claim, just like the Tudors, also relies on that same John of Gaunt bloodline. Now, do you see the problem? The DNA test proved a break in the male line somewhere between Edward III and today. The scientists couldn't pinpoint where the break happened. But there are two horrifying possibilities. Possibility 1. The break happened in Richard III's own line. Maybe his father wasn't his father. This would mean Richard III himself was never the rightful king. Possibility 2. This one is far more devastating. The break happened in the other line, the John of Gaunt line, the line of the Tudors and the Stuarts. If that's the case, it means Henry VII had no blood claim. It means his son, the infamous Henry VIII, had no blood claim. It means Elizabeth I had no blood claim. And, most importantly, it means Mary, Queen of Scots's son, James I, had no blood claim when he took the English throne. It would mean that for over 500 years, the crown has been passed down a line of monarchs who, genetically, were not the rightful heirs. This is the bombshell. The discovery of Richard's bones wasn't just about solving a murder mystery. It was an accidental DNA test on the legitimacy of the entire monarchy. With the myth of pure blood shattered, the monarchy had only one defense left. What really matters, law or DNA? In the immediate fallout, as headlines about the DNA bombshell exploded, royal experts and constitutional lawyers had to step in fast. They needed to remind the country of one simple, crucial fact. The monarchy doesn't actually run on DNA. It runs on law. For centuries, the monarch's claim was tied to the idea of divine right and pure blood. But the thing nobody tells you is that this idea was officially replaced over 300 years ago. The Act of Settlement of 1701 is a law passed by Parliament that legally defines who can and cannot be the monarch. In the modern era, the foundation of the king's legitimacy is built not on a fragile 500-year-old blood connection to John of Gaunt, but on the solid bedrock of laws passed by a democratic government. The authority of the crown is derived from Parliament and the will of the people, enshrined in statutes like the Act of Settlement, which long ago superseded any nebulous claim of divine right. Therefore, while the DNA findings represent a massive historical scandal, a revelation that sends shockwaves through centuries of accepted genealogy, they do not constitute a constitutional crisis. The intricate legal and political machinery of the modern state is entirely indifferent to a genetic anomaly in a medieval dynasty. The king will not be overthrown, nor will the line of succession be altered, because of a Y chromosome test conducted on a long dead predecessor. The rules of the game have simply changed too profoundly. What this scientific discovery did accomplish, however, was something arguably more profound and culturally significant. It irrevocably ended the myth. With the certainty of genetic data, it shattered the centuries-old, carefully cultivated fantasy of an unbroken, pure, and sacred royal bloodline, the very mystique that propped up the throne for much of its existence. This single finding stripped away the veneer of divine ordination and proved that the monarchy, for all its dazzling pomp and solemn ceremony, is a fundamentally human institution. It is a lineage as fallible and as messy as any other, full of the same secrets, whispered affairs, and hidden histories that characterize families everywhere. So what do you think? If the royal bloodline is broken, does the monarchy even deserve to exist? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And don't forget to like and subscribe for more fascinating stories. Thanks for watching.